Our gospel reading tonight comes to us from John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today I have an unorthodox beginning to this message. Have you you heard that Marie Kondo is done with perfect tidying? Does everyone here know who Marie Kondo is? Some people are nodding. Uh, Well, according to the Washington Post, it's true. She's done with perfect tidying. She's eased up on herself. But for those who don't know, Marie Kondo is a Japanese lifestyle guru. She's become world famous for a simple concept that she calls konmari. You gather all of your belongings, one category at a time, and then you go through them. You ask a simple question of each individual belonging. Every book, (laughs) every knick-knack, you ask, does this spark joy? Does this make me feel joy as I look at it? And if if the answer is no, you get rid of it. Get rid of everything that doesn't spark joy. This This is her idea. And the idea is that if you can do this with everything you own, go through it all, your life will naturally be simpler, less stressful, more joyful. And the concept has been wildly popular in the last couple of years. She sold millions of copies of her book. Uh, She's kick-started a consulting empire. She has her own Netflix show called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. Now, now, the question, of course, is why is this so popular? And I, I don't think it takes too much of a stretch to answer, right? Because our lives are so full of stuff. Our homes probably are each quite full of stuff, and I would hazard a guess that your home is not full exclusively of stuff that sparks joy in your life. And as your life and your house gets more full of stuff, as your life gets more cluttered, more complicated, it gets more stressful too, right? There's a degree to which what Marie Kondo is saying makes sense. But I started out by saying that she's done with perfect tidying. Her life previously was was a picture of tidiness, cleanliness, and simplicity, but now she says she's done. What changed? Well, you might think it was the business empire, but no, that wasn't it. Apparently, it was having kids. (laughs) And... Honestly, I think that that overwhelmed parents around the world breathed a collective sigh of relief. We knew it. 
We knew it. It's not just me. My children in my house are a force of mass destruction, mass clutter. If I think the house is clean, they will prove me wrong by showing where I have shoved things. And apparently Marie Kondo, for all of her expertise, agrees. One kid, she mostly kept up. Two kids, she mostly gave up. Three kids, she was done. Now, now she says that she takes joy not only in the simplicity but in, of possessions, but in doing things she loves. And she has a whole new th- mantra to live by and a whole new idea to sell. But today we're not here to talk about Marie Kondo. We're here to talk about Mary. Mary. Now again, there's several Marys in the Bible. But today we're talking about Mary, who is the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus, Lazarus, that that Mary who sat at Jesus' feet while Martha worked. We're talking about the Mary, who and the Martha for that matter, who said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, and who watched Jesus raise her brother from the dead. It's this Mary who in today's reading pours out that ointment, that perfume upon Jesus' feet. Now, Mary might not be a lifestyle guru. I have a feeling that that she hasn't got a consulting empire. She hasn't sold books that have her name on the cover. But she does have an important lesson for us today. After all, in both Matthew and Mark, Jesus says of Mary's actions, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Why is it that Mary's actions are told everywhere the gospel is proclaimed? Well, let's look back at the story to find out. Now, sometime after Lazarus has been raised from the dead, in the midst of fierce Pharisee criticism and even plots against Jesus and Lazarus' life, Jesus is invited to dinner with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We're told Lazarus is reclining at table with Jesus as if it's a joke. John says that Martha is serving. Mary, however, is doing something else, something different, something amazing. She takes a jar of expensive ointment, nard, pure nard, and she pours out this upon Jesus' feet. And and so much is poured out that it fills the house with its fragrance. And, And at this, we're told, Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples, you probably have heard of him, Judas is furious. Judas asks, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii given to the poor? At this point, John lets us in on a secret. Judas doesn't care about the poor. No. Judas doesn't care about the poor at all. In fact, Judas was kind of like a treasurer in Jesus' ministry, but but he'd been abusing his position of power to steal from Jesus and the disciples own money bags. And and this guy, this guy has the audacity to criticize Mary's gift. Now, before we go on, note the contrast which John has set up in the way that he's written this gospel story. The contrast between Mary and Judas. Mary gives. Mary gives so abundantly, as, as, as Judas points out very rudely, Mary gives extravagantly. The perfume she's purchased and poured out on Jesus' feet was worth a year's wages. I know we live in a culture that values experiences more than stuff, but can you imagine pouring a year's wages on anyone's feet. 
I, I certainly cannot. What a sacrifice. What a gift. How many other things might she have done with that money? How many other things might she have purchased which, which would spark joy in her life? But Mary acts as if none of that matters. Whatever the reason, whatever is going through her head, she pours it out. And Jesus, for his part, he defends her. Whether it's fiscally responsible or not, he defends her. And, and she's given the gift. She's done what she's done. So that's Mary. But Judas? Judas is different. Judas can't imagine doing what Mary did. Judas can't imagine giving a gift that extravagant. He, he doesn't think what Mary's done is responsible. He, he seems worried only about what he can get for himself, what he can take. He talks a good talk, but he does so for selfish reasons, not for any, not for the reasons he's implying. And Judas, Judas' greed, this desire to get, this need for more, well, we know where Judas' greed is going to lead. Judas' greed is going to kill Jesus and himself. That, that is the contrast that we're given. But then why, if there's this sharp contrast, is it that Mary's gift is going to be celebrated told and told and shared again, proclaimed anywhere Jesus' gospel is shared. It's not just that Mary is a giver or an extravagant giver, and Judas is not. It's because this action, Mary's action, is such a beautiful microcosm of the gospel itself. Mary was not the only one in the room who knew how to give extravagantly or to give sacrificially, for that matter. As we well know, Jesus was a giver and a good one. Jesus knows how to give sa sacrificially and extravagantly, even more extravagantly than Mary. For what gift could be more extravagant than eternal life and forgiveness of sins? What sacrifice could be greater than Jesus' own suffering and death on the cross? Jesus points to Mary, draws our attention to Mary to help us understand what He's about to do Himself. But we have to ask, why does Mary do this? Why would Mary do such a thing, give so extravagantly? Is it just her nature? I don't think it is. See, I started asking the question, started this sermon asking the question, what could make Marie Kondo give up tidying? And the answer we gave was simple. It was children. And we know the power of parenthood to change people. Just to give one example, how many parents have poured out wild and extravagant sums of money on one trip to Disney World? Yes, parenthood is powerful. But what made Mary do what she did? We know that answer, don't we? We know the answer because we, in a sense, have lived it ourselves. Mary met Jesus. And just the encounter with Jesus, because Jesus' encounters are never simple things, the encounter with Jesus changed her life, brought her brother back from the dead. Mary's extravagant giving goes back to that story with Lazarus back to her sitting at Jesus' feet, 
because Lazarus was raised from the dead and she had received this beautiful and extravagant gift. Mary watched the world closing in around Jesus, seeking to criticize, seeking to even kill Him for this gift, the gift of her brother back from the dead. And she felt such an opposite emotion (laughs) that she couldn't help but act upon it. The world wanted to kill Jesus, but Mary felt nothing but gratitude, life-changing gratitude. Jesus had given her, her brother back from death, and everything else paled in comparison. As I said, we have lived this same encounter. Jesus hasn't just given us a brother or sister back from death, but our very own lives. We have been given sins freely forgiven, extravagantly and sacrificially forgiven at no cost. Anything that we do now, any giving that we do now, pales in comparison to what Jesus did first. And any giving that we do now, like Mary's, flows first out of what Jesus first gave to us. As John will later say in his first letter, we love because he first loved us. So you and I are each blessed today to join John in telling Mary's story to join John in telling our own stories, the life-changing encounters that we have had with this same Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we have that very peace of God, which passes all understanding and which guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mary was a witness to Christ. And when you give, you are too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, everything we have and everything we are first comes from you. We thank you especially for the gift of Jesus, the fact that he came into our world, taught so many individuals, Mary especially, and lived a perfect life that he might die the perfect death, that we might have all of our sins forgiven, and that we might live forever with you Help us to experience and receive these gifts that Jesus has given to us that we, like Mary, might be changed by them, that we might not leave this place unchanged, but that we we might go out into the world today to be extravagant and sacrificial givers, just like Jesus was first a giver for us. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.